All right, so let's take a look together at 1 Kings 19. The Bible says, Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elisha replied. Elijah replied, what have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and become his attendant. Don't miss that. It doesn't say to become the next great prophet. It says become his attendant. Let's pray together. Father God, precious Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this place, Lord. We invite you to speak and to correct, to instruct, and to shape your people. Lord, this is such a, such a powerful story, and it's remembered for many reasons. But Lord, let us hear the reason that you have for communicating it today. Let us hear what your Spirit says to the Bridge Church this morning. We ask, Father, that this would be done perfectly in accordance with your perfect will. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to begin with something you already know, and, and probably anyway, and, and move into what you may not. And if you've attended here any length of time, you know that the activity that we engage in on this earth either prepares or disqualifies us for the kingdom that is to come. That's what Jesus taught us. I had three men in my life that without whom I doubt that I would be here. I believe I'd still love the Lord. Uh, I hope that I'd be hearing from God. But without their willingness to pour into my life, I would not be prepared for the challenges that were laid before me, for the call of Jesus on my life and for the ministry that God called me to. Had I come here without the ministry of these men, I don't believe that this church would be succeeding as it is, nor would we have this renovated sanctuary, nor would the ministries that we've started be in place, not because it's all about me, but because the Lord prepared me with that gift of administration by pouring into my life through servants that were already doing it. One of them was, went on to be the head of a global research, Christian global research company, worked with uh, Christian organizations all across the world. Uh, one of them became a mega church pastor, and the other one is, was just this fantastic preacher that just taught me how to love people and, and to want to build a church that reached everyone. And I believe that if there's no other reason that we need the bridge to prepare us for the coming kingdom, that we should be engaged in the, in the business that God has given us. Meaning, even if we didn't reach another person, we would still be responsible to go ye therefore and try to make disciples. Even if everyone rejected our message because we need to engage in the activity of God to be shaped and to be molded for the work that he has for us in eternity. One of the regrets that I have in my life is that my own father wasn't capable of being my spiritual father, not that he wasn't called to be, but because he had never surrendered his life to Christ when I was a young man. Now, he may have been proud of what I did. He may have been proud of my accomplishments, but he could not understand the joy I felt in serving the Lord, nor did his heart swell when, when he saw his children lost in intimacy with Jesus Christ. I could tell my dad I loved him and hug him and visit him, but when I would go back to where I grew up, I looked more forward to the times when I met with my spiritual fathers because I knew the joy that I brought to them by serving Jesus faithfully. And, and that's something I want to share with, with you today. I want to speak to every person in this room who is serious about leaving behind a, a path to follow for those that are coming behind you, maybe those in your family, others that the Lord connects you with. And I want to start with a big picture question, and that is, whose mantle did you pick up and who will pick yours up? Uh, this will determine the activity you engage in. This will determine who you become. When I, when I would walk with these men, when I would study them, when I would follow them, when I looked at what they did, it was speaking into my life about who I would become. And so the Bible says, if you walk with the wise, you'll become wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. We could, I could go on and on with verses like that, as iron sharpens iron, but the Bible warns us that the company that we surround ourselves with shapes and informs the people that we will become. Doesn't mean we don't hang out with lost people. Absolutely not. The Bible makes that clear. I'm not telling you not to go and hang out with lost people, but we should be surrounded by people 
who help us to accomplish the call of Jesus on our lives. Now, many of us know the story of the mantle. I I spoke of this a week or two ago, but if you're new here or or you weren't there, then I'll refresh your memory. Elisha was told he was going to be taken to heaven. Elijah was told he was going to be taken to heaven. He was going to basically be raptured out of this earth. He's going to bodily leave the earth. He was not going to die. He was going to leave while he was still walking, talking, and breathing. Elisha, his understudy, makes a powerful request. I would like a double portion of your spirit. This speaks of the firstborn's inheritance. So if you had four sons, you would divide your inheritance five ways. The eldest would get the double portion because he would be responsible to take your place in the community, to distribute your wealth, to to handle the issues that you would handle in in the community that you lived in. And Elijah says, as we're gonna look at, that he had asked for a difficult thing but that if he was present when God took him, he would receive what he asked for. When all was said and done, and Elijah had been taken, Elisha picks up the mantle of Elijah. It's the only thing left of Elijah. And in 2 Kings 2, he touches the same river, the Jordan River that they had par- that, that, that Elijah had parted, and Elisha parts it in the same way. And don't miss this. There is an immediate demonstration of legitimacy. God doesn't ask us to accept anybody's appointment by faith, but by evidence. Jesus said, by their fruit, you will know them. I've met a lot of peacocks in ministry. I'm just telling you this, man. They they love to be praised. They love the attention. I was looking at one pastor's wife the other night, and I'm like, this lady just doesn't got a lip filler. Like, she just looked like a duck. I'm like, who are you? You know, who are we trying to impress when when we do that? There is an immediate demonstration, not of popularity, but of authenticity. Authenticity. Now, this is important because when Elisha began to follow Elijah, it was said of him that he was the one who used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. In other words, before Elijah would eat his meal, Elisha would come with a, with a pan, much like Jesus did, and wash the feet of the disciples. He would wash Elijah's hands so that he would be not only ready to eat, but almost also ceremonially pure. The, the many of the Jewish leaders believed that you had to wash before eating. And so that's who he was known as. Now, I'm sure behind the scenes, he was watching Elijah as a preacher, as a prophet, as a minister, But what he was developing, much like Joshua did, was humility. He was developing humility and learning how to serve. In 2 Kings 2.15, we read, The company of the prophets from Jericho who were watching as Elisha comes back said, The spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. And it said they went to meet him and bowed to the ground in submission before him. I want you to note something, both the ministry and the authority of Elijah, which dictated the submission of the prophets from Jericho, was conferred to Elisha. They recognized not only did he have the same power, but he's walking in that anointing and in that authority. There was nothing lacking. It was a true firstborn's inheritance. And I want you to think about this. What did it take to get Elisha to that point? Because some of you may be longing for impact in your life. You're longing to see God move in your marriage, in your ministry, in your family, in your walk. And some of you may be called to a ministry where you're not the conclusion of it, but you're the beginning of it. We celebrate, for example, Billy Graham. But who here knows the name of the guy who faithfully preached that little meeting where Billy Graham gave his life to the Lord and himself into the service of God. Everybody else was calling those meetings a failure. Nobody turned up, didn't get a good crowd. The preacher's name was Mordecai Fowler Ham. And he was, called, he was not known as anything great. But like we looked at last week, what did Jesus say? Even the, giving a cup of cold water to a prophet entitles you to a prophet's reward. Every soul saved under the ministry of Billy Graham, Mordecai Ham receives a reward for it. And so Elisha, knowing the way God operates, does not say, I need to prioritize acting like I'm in charge. I need to prioritize so everybody respects me and bows to me. That happens. 
but he prioritizes humbling himself before the Lord in the ministry that God calls him to. I want to speak to you about three principles and, and, let, and maybe do a spiritual gut check to make sure they're at work in our lives. If they are, you likely picked up the right mantle. If they're not, you may need to kind of stop right now. C.S. Lewis said, the, the most progressive person is not the one who keeps going in the same direction. He says, the most progressive person is the one who, when they see they are going the wrong way, stops and turns around. We see progress is just blindly going down the road into all sorts of change in this world. Sometimes we have to stop and say, wait a minute, this is wrong. And I need to cease this right now. The first thing that I see is a willingness to accept or pick up the mantle and all that comes with it. This is what verses 19 and 20 speak of. I want you to picture the scene. Elijah approaches Elisha, and he's in the middle of living his life. He's, he's plowing. He's got 12 yoke of, yokes of oxen. This is a big field, man. You don't plow with 12 yoke of oxen if you're just doing a little garden. So he's got this big field, and he's plowing in the middle of living his life. And Elijah throws his cloak over him. It's his mantle. And then Elijah just keeps on walking. This is important because Elijah knows his ministry isn't predicated on anyone else's obedience but his own. Before I came here, I was asked with a team to go into Mount Vernon, Illinois, a little town of about 15,000, and plant a church in an abandoned building. And it meant that there's nobody there, there's no money for a paycheck, but also that we had to assume the mortgage, the insurance, the utilities, all that kind of stuff. Didn't have a very much, if any, uh, outside assistance, and certainly not for very long. And so the plan was obviously... Let's go and let's try to get this going, get this as big as possible. We launched with over 100. Everything seemed to be going great. The problem is then COVID hit. God had radically reorient our plans. Now, interestingly, when I got there, one of the questions, because I would have some these, these preparation meetings for the launch team, and it, it was growing and growing and people were getting interested. And one of the questions is, why are we planting another church here? If you Google Barna, most churched areas of the United States, Barna is the number one source for church data in the country. If you Google Barna, uh, most churched areas in the United States, Mount Vernon, Illinois is number seven. Per capita, per, per the population, m- more churches than just about any other place in the country. And somebody said, why would, we, would you, would you want to plant another church here? You know, the, the right answer is, I don't know but I know I need to be obedient. See, I don't know if that area needed another church, but our worship leader was trained up there. And another worship leader on the East Coast was trained up there. And youth leaders were trained up there. And God shifted gears so that during that time, when everything was closed down, and when churches were struggling, we could be able to build up ministers that would come in to other churches. And that's what, I had no idea of that. God didn't tell me that. But Elijah is not worried about what Elisha is going to say. It doesn't matter if Elisha says yes or no. Uh, look at, look at uh, 1 Kings 19.16. God is speaking and he says, also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahola to see, succeed you as prophet. Now why that's significant is because Jehu started out well and then drifted away and got got caught up in a lot of spiritual pride. He got caught up in being the king of Israel and really began to abandon the Lord. And God turned his back on him. Elisha was faithful. None of that had to do with Elijah. What Elijah had to do was be obedient to the Lord. God wasn't saying, I'm calling you to be responsible for the outcome of the lives of the people that you pour into. He's simply saying, this is what I want you to do. This is the call that I have on your life. Now, I have no clue how much Elijah was like Elisha, and it doesn't really matter. We're called to pass along a passion for obedience to Jesus, not our personal preferences. That's one of the great marks, the hallmarks of a great church, is can we love people that are radically different than ourselves. And that's why the love of Christ in us is so important. The man who mentored me was a Canadian socialist. I mean, I, my dad 
I, I, I jokingly called him Barney, uh, uh, what's his name from All in the Family? <laughs> uh, Archie Bunker with a PhD. I, I, I mean, that, my, my dad was, made, made Ronald Reagan look like a leftist communist, right? And now the guy who's pouring into my life is a Canadian socialist. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. God wants us to be able to pour into the lives. And I don't think God said to Elijah, hey, you guys got some names that are really similar. I think you'll hit it off. I, I think your political views will line. It didn't matter. Elijah, you're responsible to walk in obedience. Elisha, you're responsible to receive in humility. That was, that was all God was asking. Because if we can't love people who see the world radically different than we do, we may very well miss God's appointment for our lives. Some of us dads, we create problems with our kids because we expect them to be like us more than we expect them to be like Jesus Christ. I see this at sporting events, colleges, piano recitals. Parents see themselves, their kids as an extension of themselves, or they try to live their lives vicariously through their children. The truth is that God may have a radically different plan for, in mind for my son, and I need to be man enough to build him up and lift him up to walk in that plan, not in my agenda for his life. Even if I'm not his Elijah, I need to prepare him for the moment of that anointing. That's why Jesus speaks so frequently of readiness. Go through the parables and see the teachings of Jesus and see how often he speaks of readiness because it's not just the readiness for the day he returns. It's the readiness. That's why he condemned Jerusalem. He said, you were not ready. You were not ready for the move of God and the activity of God. All the things that the Lord, he said, how often I would have gathered you together as a hen gathers her chicks, but you wouldn't. You wouldn't. You were resisting. Stephen said the same thing to the Pharisees. You are always resisting what God is trying to do. Go all the way back. The pattern we see throughout scripture, we see Jesus and he's pouring into the lives of 12 men. We see Peter, and he's pouring into the life of Mark. Matter of fact, the gospel of Mark is probably the gospel of Peter that Mark wrote down because Mark, Mark attended Peter. We see Paul pouring into the life of Timothy. We see Elijah pouring into the life of Elijah. We see Moses pouring into the life. This is the pattern of Joshua. This is the pattern of Scripture. Jesus actually referenced this in Luke 9. A man comes to Jesus, and Jesus says, follow me. And the man says, let me go back and say goodbye to my parents. And he says, no one. And he's using this reference. He says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. See, the man probably thought he was being all spiritual. Oh, I'm going to be like Elisha. Jesus is saying, nope, something way bigger than Elisha is here. Something way more important than Elijah and Elisha is here. This, this is not just another prophet on the scene. This is eternity. This is the Messiah. This is the Savior. And, and what he demands of us is readiness. He comes to the fig tree. It's not in leaf. It's not the season for figs. And he curses it. And he says, may no one eat fruit, fruit from you again. Jesus is trying to teach us that when God shows up on our life and God is looking for fruit in our lives, it had better be there. The second thing is there needs to be a break with everyone else's expectations, but God's. That's what we see in verses 20 and 21. Some of us are still trying to live up to our parents' expectations. It's the God and syndrome. Well, I want to serve God, but I want to please this person and that person and so on. The truth is, until you get to the place where you know who God called you to be, you know what God called you to do and what it will take to get there and commit yourself to following that plan, you aren't going to be pleasing in the sight of the Lord. I tell young Christians all the time, what do I do now? Right, I give my life to Jesus Christ. I've been born again, filled with the Spirit. What do I do now? Go after the call of God on your life. Begin to pray for what that is. Have, ask God to define that. The Bible says we are to make our calling sure. We're to be certain about what God has called us to do. My parents wanted me to be a lawyer. I'm, I'm way too gentle and sensitive for, for that. Um, but, but what if I had said, well, okay, God, I'll be a lawyer, I'll just go to church and I'll give to your work and I'll serve there, but I want to please my parents and be obedient to you. It's a choice that had to be made. That's the difference between serving the Lord and walking in your call. Jesus sent someone into my life with a mantle I was to wear and I had a choice 
to walk in it. The funny thing is my brother, who is the gentle, sensitive, everybody likes him kind of guy, ended up being a lawyer. And it's his father-in-law that was my Elijah. That's how the Lord works. It's not going to make, look, if Jesus makes sense to you, you're following the wrong Jesus. Jesus did not make sense to the disciples. It didn't make sense to the world. It didn't make sense to the religious leaders. We look back now and go, oh, how did the cross make sense at the time? How did the son of God, the king of kings, washing feet make sense? How did this this being that created all things end up in a stable, in a manger for his birth? It doesn't make sense until it does. Until you look back and you see, see, let me tell you what. I don't know how many people have come up to me and go, you know, you're kind of different from a lot of preachers. And I'm like, I'm different from the ones you know. I'm different from the ones you know. Why don't you try studying some, because they weren't, they weren't my mentors. They weren't the ones who poured into my life. The ones that I was enthralled with, the ones that God put on my heart, men like Wesley, Spurgeon, and Tanner, and Lee, men who changed the world, men who were not afraid to preach it hard. See, this is the, the thing. When you look at, at revivals across Christian history, some of them come through Methodists like Wesley. Some of them come through Baptists. Some of them come through Pentecostals. You know what? They all preach the same thing. They lifted up Christ and they said, be filled with the Spirit. And I don't care if I'm talking to Lutherans, Catholics. I'm a, I grew up Catholic. I got saved into a Pentecostal church. I went to a Baptist seminary. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, Jesus didn't say, go down to the altar and say a prayer. He said, take up your cross monthly, right? Daily. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Paul, speaking to people who were walking in all the gifts, said, be filled with this. What do you mean, Paul? I I, I mean, we're manifesting all these spiritual gifts. You don't have enough God. Go after more. See, those were the people that really lit a fire under me. I was telling telling Tyler, I said, if you ever want me to get me fired up before preaching, and I noticed he did this morning, I said, there's two songs. They're both by Owl City, believe it or not. That's not my favorite band, but they're both by the same guy. One of them he wrote with a guy from Blink-182, and it sounded like a combination of Blink-182 and, and, and Owl City, which if you're into music, no, these two don't match. It's kind of like, you know, Metallica and the Carpenters or something, and it's, it's, like, it's like these two, until they do, and you're like, yeah, now I want the album. But it's a song called Dementia, and, he's, and the chorus is Dementia, you're driving me crazy. And he's speaking of the craziness of the world and the backwardness of the world, and the more I'm, a, it just drives me nuts to see the backwards, backwardness of this world. But the other one is called Embers, and it speaks of the church getting stirred up. Like, like it used to be this raging fire, but now it's these just hot coals. And he's saying, stir it up. Burn, get the embers burning bright. The Bible says that we should shine like stars in the universe. It, the, the light should make other people uncomfortable, right? You ever flip on a light in a dark room and, and, and people are like, oh, what'd you do that for? That's the way we're supposed to be operating spiritually. See, here's what, here's what 2 Kings 13, 14 says. Elisha was suffering from the illness from which he died. Jehoash, king of Israel, went down to see him and wept over him. My father, my father, he cried, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. Now, why is that important? Some people read 1 Kings 19 and they see Elisha taken up into heaven and the you know, chariots of fire and they think that's what, that's what Elisha was speaking of. It's not. It was a Hebrew phrase, which meant that you are the real power behind our might. You are the real power behind our might. It's why David's most egregious sin was not adultery with Bathsheba. It was taking of the census. Even Joab, which was this carnal guy who elevated himself through murder, tried to warn that Joab was a military commander in chief. And he's like, David, don't do this. Because David wanted to take a census in his pride. Let's see how big Israel has gotten. Let's see how mighty our military is. And Joab was saying, David, you know, and I know that it is, I've commanded this army, David. I have been rocking with them for years. You know, and I know that it is not our military might. It is not our advanced weaponry. It is the anointing of God on your life 
that is in David, Saul, his slain is thousands, but David, his tens of thousands. Even before you were king, you had an anointing on your life to build up this country. Don't do this. And David did it, and almost as soon as he did it, as soon as the first numbers came in, he was repenting, and a plague came upon Israel that killed tens of thousands. And so when this king comes to see Elisha, this king, by the way, who's, a, who's pretty much a pagan king, but he says, the chariots and horsemen of Israel, meaning you're the real power. All the ble- We would see a king, for example, come in and, 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 and try to invade Israel, and Elisha would tell the king where he's going to be. And then the king would be like, all right, I'm not going to try that route. I'll try this route. And Elisha would tell the king where he's going to be. And then the army was struck blind and led into Jerusalem. This, this, this army that is surrounding Elisha, trying to take him prisoner, and he's not even worried about it at all because he knows the power of God rests upon him. He's not worried at all about what might happen. And it's interesting, the last words that Elijah heard before he left this earth was Elisha saying, my father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And the last words that Elisha heard before he left this earth, my father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. The actual anointing of God that that he had sought had rested upon him. Sometimes we focus so much on, well, he he picked up the mantle and he parted the Jordan and that was the evidence and the, the prophets came and bowed before him. The genuine evidence is the life we lead and the impact it leaves behind. The sad thing is that at the end of Elisha's life, he was buried, he was put in a tomb. And many, many years later, some men were burying somebody in the same cemetery and some robbers were coming down the road and they panicked and they just threw their friend into the tomb of Elisha to try to run. And as soon as the man hit Elisha's bones, he was raised to life. And we go, wow, that's amazing. What a great miracle. It's sad because what it means is that that anointing and that power stayed with Elisha. It stayed with Elisha. Where Elijah passed it on, Elisha was unable. We have to have a commitment to bring others into our anointing. Now understand something. Elisha had his own Elisha. The man's name was Gehazi. But apart from him, we have no other name associated with the ministry of Elisha where the person was close enough to Elisha to inherit the mantle. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 2. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, so we're going back to the original anointing. Tell me what can I do for you before I'm taken from you? Well, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elisha said. Now pay attention to this. If you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. There's no equivocation here. There's no maybe. There's no might. Elijah's not saying, hey, man, I'm sorry to see you go. I don't want to have a lingering goodbye. You know, I'll see you on the other side, man. I'm going to go home and, and catch some football. By the way, can you send that anointing? Elijah says very clearly, if you're with me when I leave the world, it'll be yours. If you're not, it won't. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. We know the rest of the story. Elisha walks in that anointing. Now, what the Lord is trying to speak to us about is the power of proximity, being near to that which is going to anoint us. And why that's important is that Gehazi was the attendant of Elisha, and yet he didn't receive anything. Because he did not study humility. He wanted the anointing to make money. He wanted the anointing. He actually tried to use the giftedness and the prophetic ability of Elisha to make money for himself. And God struck him with leprosy, meaning he was now considered unclean in the sight of the Lord. See, it's not just about physical proximity that God is calling us to. That's certainly the foreshadowing element of this story. But there's something deeper. The deeper thing was the walking together. As they were walking along and talking together. In other words, I am not just called to learn the skill set of a pastor. I am called to let that person pour into my life the giftedness and the Jesus-like qualities that he had. 
And why that's important is that so many times we'll tend to judge people, but I'll use this illustration. Let's say you were really, really thirsty and you go up to a, a vending machine. You see one off in the distance. And you're like, great, I'm going to go get a, a soda. And you get there, but it's all scratched up. It's old and it's dented. Would you walk away and say, let me find a perfect vending machine to satisfy my thirst? Every person God pours into your life will be scratched up and dented. Every person that God places you in relationship with will have flaws. That is not what God, God is not calling us to elevate our judgmental qualities. He's calling us to look, and I, when I look at these three men, every one of them had their failings, but each one of them had something that God wanted me to receive. I had to walk with them. I had to walk in proximity, and I had to desire qualities just in the same way that Elisha said, I want a double portion. I want the firstborn inheritance of your ministry. Elisha was so close to Elijah that it took the horses and chariots of God to say, I ain't going nowhere. I ain't going. He wanted it so badly that he, I mean, man, I don't know about you, but if all of a sudden come through that door, the, fight, the chariots and horses of God, the flaming chariots of God came roaring. I'd be like, yo, right? I mean, that's, that's just, that will startle you. He was so, I'm not letting go, man. Because if that's the condition for receiving that anointing, then I'm going to, and it took the chariots and horses, horsemen of God to separate the two of them. The power of God must be, first of all, present you must have passion. You must have zeal for the, pre for the call of Christ on your life. But it also, that passion and that zeal has to be passed on or the church dies here. You know, you haven't made a disciple unless your disciple has made a disciple. You haven't made a disciple until your disciple has made a disciple. I want you to think about that. The zeal, the passion for the call that caused Elijah to run after Elijah at the beginning was still there. When it, was, when it was somebody else's turn to take it up. After all those years, lying on his deathbed, that fire was still present. It was burning brighter than ever. Just as Elisha said to Elijah, Elijah, your ministry, the ministry that I have asked to inherit is the most important thing in the world. It's more important than power. It's more important than military might, more important to these people around us than anything in the world. But it wasn't enough to just have that passion for one lifetime. That makes a great story. When it's passed on generationally, it means a church with great impact. The man who I talked about who would take a book, and I'm not making this up, to go up and down in those drop things, his name was Bill Unger, and he once told me that he thought pastoring was the most important thing that someone could do. And I agree, I'd better. Because if I don't, no one else around me will either. If you're a missionary, you should feel the same. If you teach two-year-olds, you should get excited to see the next generation coming to the knowledge of Jesus. If you're a mom with little ones, you ought to feel like that's the highest calling God could ever give someone. If God has called you man of God to shepherd your family and represent Jesus as a man of integrity and purity and honor and to serve the body of Christ, then you ought to be fired up about taking that mantle. Because two things, you won't be zealous about the call of Christ if you're just doing what everybody else thinks you should do. You need to hear from Jesus. He wants to send somebody into your life. And this is the second thing. God is looking at you so that he can send somebody else, put them in proximity to you so that they can catch that same anointing and walk in it once, you, once you're gone. If you don't think the call in your, of God on your life is incredibly important, where did you get that idea? It means you're closer to the source of negativity and discouragement than you are to the source of your power. Here's one thing I know. I was a wretch. Man, sometimes I read you know, the lyrics to Amazing Grace, and I think the word wretch wasn't a strong enough word. Some people want to change it to saved a soul like me. I'm like, I, can, we, can we find a one-syllable word that actually means worse than a wretch? If you can do that, that, that describes me. And yet God saw in me a preacher of the gospel. And I told him, God, I'll go anywhere you tell me to go. Whether it's a big church, whether it's a church plant, 
whether it's some closed down church or some church that's, that's barely hanging on, it doesn't matter, God. I'll go wherever you call me to go because I want to get to the end of my life and be able to know that I fulfilled the call of Christ. Paul said, I've run the race. I fought the fight. I finished the course. You can't say that if you don't know what it looks like. If you haven't received it from God, you can maybe get to the end of your life and say, I was faithful in church and I did all sorts of stuff, but that just sounds like the people in Matthew 7, but Lord, didn't we do this? And didn't we do that? And he said, depart from me. I never knew you. You didn't get that from me. That's not what I called you to do. I didn't call you to compare yourself to somebody else. I didn't call you, David, to preach like somebody else. I didn't call you to pastor like somebody else. I know who you are, and I know what I'm calling you to do. And see, it wouldn't have made any sense. Imagine if Elijah puts his cloak on Elisha, and Elisha tries to stretch it around those oxen. Not going to fit. It's not going to fit. And you know what he does? He slaughters the, I mean, this is 12 yoke of oxen. That's a lot of barbecue, guys. That is a lot of barbecue. He feeds the entire city to make a statement. That life is done. From this point on, I am defined by the mantle that was just placed around me. Let's stand together. Church, as we close, I want to get close to the fire. I want us to think about whose expectations we're trying to live up to whether we've really broken the apron springs of our human inclinations, the religion we were brought up with. Some of us, man, we, look, if you're not somebody that's called to do this, I'm not telling you how to worship, but some of us can't worship freely. We we'll talk about this next week. We're going to be, you know, celebrating the 4th of July. Some of us aren't walking in our freedom. Some of us, we can't, we can't release ourselves to the Lord, we can't worship with tears. We can't worship with shouts. We can't worship with our arms raised because I wasn't taught that way. You haven't broken the chains of the expectations. You haven't killed the cow. You haven't had the barbecue. You haven't said this is where that life ends and the call of God on my life begins. Father, in the name of Jesus, I know you wouldn't have had me preach this message if there was not somebody in this place that you had a call on their life. Somebody's a missionary, but they don't know it. Somebody's a pastor, but they don't know it. Somebody's a teacher, but they don't know it. Somebody's a youth leader, but they don't know it. Somebody's an evangelist, but they don't know it. Somebody's a witness that's so anointed, they're leading people through the doors by the score, but the devil has kept us blinded. Father, today, open the eyes of the ones that you have a call on. Your servant Paul told us, that your servants, the Jewish people, had a veil over their eyes. They couldn't see. They couldn't see their role. They couldn't see the call. Father God, let no one in this place, let no one who's watching online miss the appointment, the anointing, and the call that you created them to accomplish. And church, as we close, 2 Peter 1.10 says, Make your calling sure. That mantle was for one man. Your call is for only you. None of us are called to be backup players, second string players. God has a call on your life. And if you're not sure what that is, make it your goal. Make it your aim from this moment forward. God, everything else can get pushed aside. Knowing what you've called me to do is the most important thing in my life. And if the Lord, the Holy Spirit has spoken to you today, I want to pray with you as you surrender to that call. In the name of Jesus, this altar is open. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. I said those words, my wife said those words to me 35 years ago tomorrow. And when I look at her and I see the person who held me when I lost people, that I love dearly. See the person who cared for me when I was so sick I couldn't move. See the person who loved me at my worst. Promise kept. Oftentimes I'll go on social media and I'll see posts from young people that are serving Jesus Christ that came up 
my ministry. Nick got saved 17 years old at a church I was pastoring. And I'll see people that are walking with Jesus faithfully, having kept the promise. Church, we see too many people. We've seen it in the last month. Ministers that get to the end of their ministries and they stumble at face, face plan at the finish line. It's sad. I want to be able to say to the Lord, Jesus, you called me to do this. And you told me even when everybody else, the, the pastor that married us said that I was not a suitable pastor. He collapsed two churches, by the way. Even when other people were telling me, this isn't for you. This isn't what God had for you. I know the one who called me. I know the one who's faithful. It doesn't matter what mom and dad says. It doesn't matter what anyone else says. When you know what Jesus told you to do, walk in that call. Yes. Because you want to be able to look him in the eye one day before you hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. You want to be able to say, promise kept, Lord. I told you I would. And I did what you called me to do. I told my wife I would love her faithfully, and I've kept that promise. I call, told my Lord, I told my Lord, no matter where you tell me to go, no matter where you send me, I had never heard of Idaho Falls. I had never heard of Southbridge, Massachusetts, or Air, Massachusetts. I had never heard of Plainfield, Connecticut. I had never heard of Mount Vernon. But Jesus had, and he loved people there. And somebody in this place, God knows who he's gonna connect you with. He's just waiting for you to say, here I am, Lord, send me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we've got a room full of people. Lord, you could you turn the world upside down with just 120 in an upper room. There's a whole lot more than that in this building. What could we do, Lord, if we got on our knees and we sought you and we prayed and we fasted and we pushed aside the things of this world and we said, God, I just want to do what you've called me to do and nothing is more important than inheriting that anointing on my life. Lord God Almighty, you are no respecter of persons. And so I pray in the name of Jesus that as humble as we may be and as big time as sinners as we may have been before we came to Jesus, Lord, see us and speak into our lives about who you've called us to be and who your spirit would make us to be. And we will make room for you to do whatever you want to. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.